Good Friday. Yes. Yesterday was Good Friday and it's a period, a period where they call it Easter, but yes, uh, someone who said uh, Passover. It's a special time. But today I'll give you a story. Are you ready to hear? Yes. Okay. So there was this little boy, two little boys who went to school together. It was Billy and Carlos. Billy liked uh, picking on cows. Every time they would go home, Carlos had to run really fast because if Billy gets catch up with him, something's gonna go on. So one day, well, they were in class because we were in class together. Since Cal uh, Billy was a lot of boys, he decides to throw, you know, paper airplanes? Yeah. Are you meant to do that in class? When yeah. he's teaching? No. Okay, so that's what he did. And just when he threw it, guess what? Teacher Tan and yes. But uh, uh, hit her face. So she was. She asked who was throwing that airplane. And quickly, Bill builds up his hand and said, "It was Carlos." Carlos said nothing. Guess what? Carlos was punished. Did Carlos really throw the paper uh, plane? Yes. Carlos no. did not throw the paper plane. It was Billy. So what happened after school? Carlos and Billy caught up. Billy caught up with Carlos and asked him, "Why would you uh, take my blame in class? I didn't. You, you're not the one who threw the paper. You knew it was me. Why didn't you call me out?" And that's when Carlos told him, because. One time someone did something special for me and this person was Jesus. Jesus died for me even though he had not committed any sin. He died on the cross and that's why we are celebrating, we were celebrating Good Friday yesterday. He was, he died for our sins, he was beaten, he was embarrassed over things that he had not done. He was killed for our sake. And Billy was shocked to hear that somebody could take somebody else's blame for something they hadn't done. So he asked him, so how do you know about this? He says, um, tell you what, how about I invite you to my church and you get to learn more about Christ? And that's how they became friends. So today, I just want to let you know that sometimes it is good to know that to appreciate what others do for us and for that matter Christ who died for our sins even though he was the son of God he died for us knowing very well that he did not deserve to die but for our sakes because he loves us he died so who's going to pray for us today <coughs> close eyes and pray Thank you for calling this day. Thank you for blessing us for the day. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us, giving us salvation. <coughs> salvation for all. For all. Through Christ our Lord. Through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
not believe that I am the Father and the Father in me. I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does work. Believe in me that I am the Father following me. Or else believe for the sake of these works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, I go, because I go to my Father.
Let's bow our heads once more as we begin. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you. So much not, not just for coming down to this earth, for the ultimate sacrifice. You're so great. It'll take us an eternity to comprehend it. But thank you so much for coming down to this earth and living with us and showing us the power so that we can understand the truth of who he is. So that we can learn to love him as we should. And serve him with joy. There's a song from 1974 by Harry Chapman called Cats in the Cradle. He's always trying to get ahead of me there. Very famous song. Words were actually written down by, most of them were written by his wife before their son was born. And the song is basically an anthem about a father and a son. And now, uh, Childhood often passes by so quickly. The lyrics visit the relationship between the father and the son at different times. When the child is born, we learn to walk. He wants to go outside and play, and he goes off to college. And you learn the song each time when these major events happen in the boy's life. His father either wasn't around or he was just too busy. Yet this never dissuaded the eagerness and the love of this young child who always walked away and remarked about his father, one day I'm going to grow up to be just like him. And at the end of the song, the father, now retired, Feeling a little alone, he tried to call up his son because he wanted to talk. However, his son, with his new job and his family, was too busy, and he didn't have the time. And the song ends with these words. As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. One of the things you get taught in science class, particularly earth science, is the difference between renewable and non-renewable resources. The things we cannot replace are considered non-renewable. And we either have to restrict our usage of these things or find a more viable alternative. Otherwise, we risk losing these resources altogether. This is supposed to help us become responsible, modern, progressive citizens of planet Earth. And it's a shame that schools don't do a better job of teaching children to treat time as a non-renewable source. Because everyone is born with a limited supply, and there is no alternative. Nothing can be more painful to any parent than the thought of being separated from their child for any length of time. The possibility that at any time the men who never see their child again is unthinkable. Imagine the heartbreak of God when billions of his children may be lost because they did not spend enough time with him. In the book of James we read, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I've been thinking about my dad a lot this week because he turned 70 on Thursday. 
You wouldn't know it because he still acts like a kid sometimes, but he really is getting up there. I can't say too much about that because I have a mildly impressive birthday coming up this summer. And uh, I can remember the time when my dad reached that age. And I remember as a child thinking how old it was when I thought about it. It doesn't seem that old now. My dad and I didn't spend a whole lot of time together when we were growing up. But he certainly made an effort to do things with us, three boys. It's a lot of work, as you can imagine. Uh, so we have scores of memories that I can look back on. And just having those memories means a great deal. Um, I can thank my father for teaching me a lot of things, like riding a bicycle, working with wood, playing chess, and uh, how important it is to hide after you accidentally shoot your neighbor's house with a potato gun. And um, I'd have to say the most important thing both he and my mother both taught me is to cherish being part of a family. I work in inner city schools on occasion and it's tragic to see the results of generations of kids without stable father figures in their lives. And you hear the talking heads with all their solutions, regulate this, prohibit that. But the truth is, I think we need to get back to that ridiculously outdated, old-fashioned, unenlightened, and unscientific notion that God has called fathers to be spiritual leaders. The Bible does have a few very specific instructions, and um, I'll read a few verses here. If you'll turn with me to Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We jump ahead to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 7, it says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And a verse I'm sure we can all remember in Proverbs 22, which we don't even have to go to. Train up a child in the way he should go, so that even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Bible teaches that the primary role of the father in his child's life is that Training. That training relationship is supposed to serve as a model for helping us understand what our Heavenly Father is attempting to do with each one of us. This is a colossal responsibility, so it's no wonder then why Satan works so hard to break up families, remove fathers in the traditional image of a father from that picture. It's not a stretch to say that the entertainment industry today has a greater impact on some children's growth and values than their own parents. And that number is growing. Every school I go to, if the kids are of a certain age, headphones are in the ear and the rest of the world is just shut out. Several schools give kids Google Chromeworks where they're supposed to be doing their work. And I don't suppose I need to tell you how often over the course of the day kids will take every opportunity they can to listen to music, watch music videos, or play games during class. We can see the results of this in the percentage of younger people who are abandoning the church completely. 
And there's no scriptural foundation to any of your thinking. I don't mean to sound like an old curmudgeon, but um, we can't afford to let Hollywood and Silicon Valley raise our kids. So what do we do? I'd say the most powerful lessons of parenting, parenting in the Bible don't come from specific instruction. I believe there is a rather annoying song from the 80s called Papa Don't Preach. doesn't particularly work terribly effectively. I'd say the most powerful examples of father-son relationships come from those that are actual examples of fathers and sons. We can look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham loved his son. He was the child of promise. He spent most of his life without a child, was desperate to have a son, was overjoyed when God promised him he would have one. Can we picture Abraham living his life for himself after his son were born? Can we possibly think of any moment where Abraham would have been too busy to spend time with his child? Do we think he left child rearing to his wife and servants? Well, you're here now. The rest of the family will take care of you. I would venture to guess that Isaac and his father even talked to God together at some times. Because, you see, Abraham's faith was built on the relationship he personally had with God. And that relationship was the result of him spending time with God and getting to know and to trust Him. And he lived that relationship every day, so it should be no surprise to us that we were to learn that Isaac learned to love and trust God exactly as his father did. This was an implicit, unquestioning trust. So one can only imagine what must have gone through Isaac's mind one day at the top of the mountain when his father revealed to him that God asked him to be sacrificed. We know the end of the story from Abraham's perspective. We know that God provided a lamb as an alternative to show us the role that he was going to play for us. But here we see a son so trusting of a God that his father introduced him to that he was willing to obey even to the point of death. And it's fitting that we talk about this now, considering what weekend it is, and what day it is. Knowing that we have another example of a son who was willing to obey to the point of death. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus, speaking of himself, took on the role of, his, of an empty vessel to carry on the work of his Father. He says, I and my Father are one. Over and over again in the messages Jesus taught, he made connections between himself and the Heavenly Father. Because his whole purpose was to show us who the Father is and counter the lies 
and distortions that Satan has been perpetuating against God since the beginning. If we love and value our children, our desire and our purpose should be the same. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's really our role for everyone, isn't it? We should be loving each other toward truth and helping each other avoid the pitfalls of a fallen world so we don't stumble and lose our way. We don't know how long each of us has here, so we'd be making, we should be making the best use of the time that we're given. And God gives us our families for that purpose, so we can learn, hopefully in the safety of our homes, what it is to have a true loving and trusting relationship so we can get a picture of the God we serve and everything that He's done for us. When it comes to our kids, we don't really have that much time to pass on these lessons. We don't have a lot of time to say everything we want to say and everything we want to do. We hope that by the grace of God, you can provide some kind of example so they have something to go on, something to take with them, something to build on as they continue on their lives. My wife and I are facing a crossroad. We've got somebody taking that next big step. I won't mention his name and embarrass him because he's not here to defend himself. I'll simply refer to him as the conspicuously unnamed college-bound individual. And I suppose if he were here, I might venture to quote from the book of Proverbs. Chapter 3, which says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Sometimes God's correction is grievous, not because he may delight in our bad feelings. But because he's trying to elevate our thinking to greater things than we understand. To uh, try to teach us lessons that we might not necessarily be able to figure out on our own. I will say certainly my father's correction was grievous at times. Sometimes there were moments when I felt I was spanked more often than my fair share because my father had this ability that he could give you a little air time before the stinging set in. I thought that was a remarkable skill. Um, and it took time to realize that the alleged severity of the punishment was of lesser value than the lessons learned by maturity. And I can now look back on and say, oh, he was right. I screwed up again. So that being said, 
any advice I could give to anyone, the adults or children, whether in general or specifically to the conspicuously unnamed college-bound individual, um, I will part with these words. Always start your day with God. Amen. Always remember to put His plan for your life first. Because whether you realize it right away or whether it takes you an entire lifetime, you will see that it is the best. Always cherish the family God gave you because He did so with a purpose. Never forget where you came from and that you will always find love here in the home where you grew up. And remember to stop by as often as you can and use that comb because there's still a lifetime of memories that we can still have together and God willing when our time on earth comes to a close and eternity of memories as well. Let's conclude our service by opening to hymn number 100, Greatest Life of Kings.
example be ever before us. Help us to live according to your will. Help us to understand your purpose for our life. More importantly, teach us to have your heart towards with the love as you love. We can share your glory. Bring others into your fold to be part of your family.